Uh, we've been looking, this all started with actually a study on the uh, Acts of the Church. Uh, we went through the book of Acts, not looking so much at the works of the apostles, but what was everybody else doing? And the rest of the church was doing quite a bit of work too, weren't they? And uh, we saw many other people being faithful in prayer, in works, and following them, and uh, giving, and those kinds of things. So we looked at that, and then we said, you know, a good place to go next would be these seven churches in the book of Revelation. As Jesus, the head of the church, the Lord and King of the church, uh, he here has some choice words uh, for this seven of the churches of the time. And now we're up to number seven, and that is the church in Laodicea. And he does not have kind words to say about them. So let's get started with it in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith who? The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And we've seen this pattern with all the letters. He always starts with who is talking. What authority does he have in saying these things? And here he makes it very clear, I am the amen. What does amen mean? So be it. So be it. I am the so be it and so it will be. Who gets to decide how it will be? God, God does. <laughs> so, so you can claim all you want, and that's going to come in uh, very important to this particular group because they think they are in charge. They think they have the authority, they have the resources, they don't need anybody else. But who is the one who says the way it will be? God, I am the amen. Also, when you pray, it's the last word. <laughs> and some interpret it that way. I am the last word, right? I have the last say and how this will be. He's also the faithful and true witness. Not only does this decide how it will be, but he is also the one who tells it the way it will be, right? When he says it will be this way, it will what? Be this way. In fact, we see that example even in the book of Revelation itself. Come save something there in chapter 3. Let's go to chapter 21. Toward the end of the book. And by this point in the book, John has seen a lot of freaky stuff. <laughs> a lot of stuff he doesn't really understand. Uh, not quite sure what it all means. And that's especially why I think this statement here at the end, toward the end of the book, is very important. Because he says in Revelation chapter 21, verse 5, And he that sat upon the throne. By the way, who sits on the throne? Jesus, Jesus sits on the throne. God sits on the throne, right? said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. He is the true and faithful witness. Don't take anybody else's word for it. He's the one that makes it happen, and he's the one that tells it like it is. Right? And he's about to tell them like it is. Not only that, but what other authority does he have? Let's go back to Revelation chapter 3. Not only that, but who is he? He is the beginning of creation. Does that give him a little authority? He's the maker. <laughs> He's the creator, isn't he? In fact, John's familiar with this. I kind of get the picture of John kind of hearing that and saying, oh yeah, I wrote about that. I know that's true. Back in John chapter 1. You're all familiar with this passage. John starts his book very well. Doesn't he? Starts it with a bang. This is who I'm talking about, right? John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And who's the Word? 
Jesus, we know he's the word. It says that later on. The word came and was manifested and showed the attributes of God to man, right? And we saw him and saw his glory. And that's very clear. He is the word and Jesus is the word. And he is the beginning of creation. When it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, we are talking about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All three took part in that creation, and he is on. Did that give him a little authority? Yeah, he's a little authority. <laughs> so, whether you agree with it or not, he's the creator, right? And what he says, go. But this also should be familiar to the people in Laodicea. What book of the Bible was written to the Laodiceans? Colossians. Colossians. Let's go to Colossians. That's not a bad one because Galatia is the ten churches there in uh, Asia Minor. But uh, actually it was Colossians. Let's go to the book of Colossians, which was studied recently in Sunday school. Now you say, wait a minute. I thought the book of Colossians was written to the church in Colossae. Well, it was. But he also says, when you read this book, send it to who? The church in Laodicea. I want them to hear this too. Read it all out. Read it all the way through. Read it to the people in Laodicea. And what was read to the people in Laodicea? Colossians chapter 1 starting in verse 12. Colossians 1, 12, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. So we have salvation. We are taken from darkness into the light through the blood of who? Jesus Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, right? He is God with us, Emmanuel, the manifestation of God, verse 16. For by him, by Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, or principalities, or powers. So who's in charge? Who's the king of kings? Who's the creator of the concept of kings? <laughs> who's, who's the creator of the concept of authority? He is. All things were created by him, speaking of who? Jesus Christ. And for him. So Laodiceans should know who this, who's speaking here, shouldn't they? He is the one, and he is before all things, and by him all things not only were created, but consist, hold together. So when he says, I am the beginning of creation, the lady to see him should say, oh yeah, I remember there was a letter about him. <laughs> I remember we got a letter from him too, didn't we? He is this one. Everything is for him. Everything consists through him. Everything was created by him, verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness of God, all fullness dwell. Right? So this is who's speaking. Does he have authority to say something? Yeah. I need a grease. Yes. Give me some amens over there, right? <laughs> so yes, he is the amen. He's the so be it. He is, this is the way it's going to be. He is the true witness. This is what's going to happen. And I am the one with all authority, right? So what does he have to say? Let's find out. Revelation chapter 3. Now that he's got their attention. <laughs> and this, this letter is going to start like others. It starts with the who I am. Then it goes immediately to I know your works. Does, what does God know? Everything. 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 He knows our works, right? He is the toughest boss to work for, isn't he? I'm very thankful he's uh, full of grace and mercy. <laughs> and he's patient because he knows everything, right? I know your works. Verse 15. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. 
I would, thou were cold or hot. I'll take either one, which is always an interesting statement to me, isn't it? You're not cold. You're not distant. You're not like some of these other churches, right? Some of these other churches were just stone cold. They had turned to other teachings, other philosophies. They had turned away from God. What was the problem with Ephesus? They had lost their first what? Love. They had gone cold to God and his ways. Is that a problem? They're also not hot. They're not like Philadelphia. They're not like Smyrna, who in the face of tremendous persecution were standing up for the word of God and standing up for what was right. They were neither. Now, I understand why he says, I don't want you hot. I mean, I'd rather you be hot, right? I'd rather you be hot. Why does he say, I'd rather you not, I'd rather you work cold. I, I mean, I, I'd rather you be cold. I'd rather you be cold. Because in reality, if you're neither hot nor cold, if you're not, if you're cold, at least he can get through to you, right? When you're cold, you know there's a problem. When you're cold, God can kind of come down on you and slam you and say, listen, he grab you by the shoulders and say, listen. <laughs> and, you, and you think, wait a minute, I am wrong. But if you're neither hot nor cold and he comes and says there's a problem, what is your first reaction? Yeah, I'm okay. <laughs> I'm okay. Nothing bad is happening. Nothing terrible. I'm, we're not following these uh, terrible teaching things like that. We're, we're having our services. Everything's just rolling right along. Got a, ain't got a problem in the world. And when you say to God, I ain't got a problem in the world, you've got a problem. That's what he's saying. You've got a problem here. How big a problem? Verse 16. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. That's not good, is it? <laughs> so what was causing this neither hot nor cold? What, what was keeping them from being either hot for the Lord or to, to, you know, so destitute that they would get God's attention? What, what, was, what was the problem? And it was in verse 17. They say they are what? Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have no need of nothing. There's a nice double <laughs> I ain't got need for nothing, right? <laughs> so, yeah. What's the problem there? Well, because when you get that kind of attitude, what? You say you don't need who? Don't need God. In fact, this is the history of Laodicea. I always like to throw a little history in, uh, into this. Actually, Laodicea was named after the wife of Antiochus II, Laodice. In fact, he named several cities after her. Must have loved her greatly. <laughs> but, uh, and actually, during Antiochus the Great, uh, Jews were moved from Babylon to Laodicea. So there was a huge Jewish population there. Uh, many, actually, many synagogues. And there was a, a temple there and everything. It was a huge Jewish population that was moved from Babylon over here to Laodicea. Uh, although the general population, uh, the original city there, before it became Laodice, Laodicea, uh, it was a smaller place, and it was basically a temple for Zeus. And uh, so the rest of the people, the Jews were worshiping God if they knew Jesus Christ. <laughs> Otherwise, they were problematic. Uh, but generally speaking, the rest of the population was uh, worshiping Zeus, Apollo, uh, the emperors, which again was very popular amongst the other cities we've seen, and also uh, the medical guy, uh, Asclepius. So yeah, they, they liked him as well. So <laughs> the snake, you got it. Snake, I got it? Okay, I got it. <laughs> like, like to check. So, yeah, so the, generally speaking, I would say this population wasn't much different than every other city we've seen so far. And there was always the Zeus, the Apollo, the emperor's worship, and some kind of other gods of some sort. But there was this Jewish population, and when Jesus Christ uh, died and rose again and the word came, many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles, too, in the city became Christians. And there was a very large church there. But... 
Just to give you an example of the problem, uh, this was on a big river. It was also on a trade route. And it was an extremely wealthy city. In fact, uh, they've done some digging around the city. They've been excavating it for, for years and years and years. And they find all these monuments and everything, and all of them basically were given by patrons. So it wasn't the city. It wasn't the emperor. It was somebody in the city would say, I'm going to build this giant temple. I'm going to build this giant monument. I'm going to... In fact, in 60 AD, the entire city was leveled by an earthquake. And the emperor, Nero, <laughs> said, hey, you need any help? And the people of Laodicea said, no. We don't need nothing. <laughs> We've got it. They were so wealthy, they're like, eh, we'll just rebuild the city. We'll take care of it. Maybe they had good insurance. I don't know. <laughs> so, so they actually rebuilt, rebuilt the city by themselves. Completely. So that kind of shows you the kind of climate this Laodicean church was in. They were, by the world standards, very what? Rich. Rich. A lot of people going to the church were these people <laughs> who were very rich in the things of the world. They were also what? Increased in goods. They had everything they could possibly need. They needed nothing. And again, from a human standpoint, what do you start thinking when you have that? Well, I must be okay with who? With God. I must be okay with God. <laughs> What's the big problem, right? But... Eventually, by the way, in 1450, uh, that's when the Turks and the Mongols came and leveled the city and it was never heard from again. So, <laughs> so it's gone. Uh, the city of Laodicea is gone. So, uh, so you kind of see what's going on. In fact, what did God eventually do? He spewed them out of his mouth. Uh, <laughs> and they were completely all gone. So they said they were rich, they were saving the increased good, they need nothing. But what was reality? What does it say after that in verse 17? And knowest not that thou art, first of all, wretched. What wasn't right with God? The heart. Their actions. Their interaction with the Gentiles and those unbelievers in the city. That the way they dealt with things. Again, mindset is, hey, we're rich. We're increasing goods. God is blessing us. God must be happy with us. Not knowing, though, in fact, in God's eyes, they were wretched. Saved, most of them probably, you hope. <laughs> but in their actions, what? Actually, wretched. And miserable. Well, how can you be miserable when you got a lot of money? <laughs> How do you be miserable when you got all the things you want? Well, because their relationship with who had a problem. And even if they realized it or not, they had a problem, didn't they? They were wretched, they were miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. So if you have that list, would you agree you need something? But they didn't know, they didn't recognize it. They didn't acknowledge it. In fact, let's go back to Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus talks about this. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 19. What is God's instruction to those who wish to truly be rich in the important things? To truly be increased in good things. Right? That's to do what? Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures where? Yeah. In heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That's the problem, isn't it? Their heart was what? Neither hot nor cold. Because where was their heart? With the cold things of the world. Right? And because they had enough of that, they figured they were fine. They needed nothing. But the reality is what? Jump down to verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold the one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot trust 
in the things of this world. You cannot trust in the systems and authorities of this world. You cannot trust in the possessions of this world and then also say, yeah, but I trust God too. You want, it'll be one or the other in the end, won't it? It will push one way or the other. And right now, they're kind of in the middle there, aren't they? And they trust God some, but they trust also their wealth and things like that. They're not really praying to God for things because they can take care of themselves. They've got good relationships with the people of the world, and so it's going to be okay, right? But is it okay? No. They're actually wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. They need who? need God. So let's go back to Revelation chapter 3 again. So God has counsel for them. Throughout history, when God says you should do this, should you do it? <laughs> so when God comes to Cain and says, you know what? Sin is at the door. Get right. Should he have listened? Oh yeah. When God said, I'm going to flood the earth, you better get right. Should they have? Absolutely. <laughs> Should do this, shouldn't you? And here's his counsel. Verse 18. I counsel you to buy of me. Buy what's important. Buy things that are eternal. Buy good things. And by buy, is he talking about money? Give your money to the church, and the church, no. <laughs> what is he saying? Buy and it, your resources, your time, your effort, your passions, your desires, that human energy, <laughs> yourself. Give to the things of who? Of God. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be truly rich, right? And to buy white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, truly clothed, right? Because really, spiritually, you're naked here. You need clothes. And that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. So how do I solve the problem of being wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? Go to who? Go to God for the things that truly Man. Now, have they heard something like this before? Let's go to Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. And the fact that this was written to the folks in Colossae and Laodicea, uh, Paul would not have written it if he hadn't heard there were problems or known there were problems there, right? So what are some of the problems that Paul was writing about sometime earlier? The um, book of Col Colossae would have been written before the book of Revelation, more than likely, um, very surely. So not many years, but sometime before. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If then you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are, what? Above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on where? Things above and not on the things of the earth. Again, you're sitting there in Laodicea. What are you saying? Oh, yeah, yeah, I do that. <laughs> yeah, 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 I do that. Meanwhile, where's your real trust? With my wealth and my influence and the things of this world. That's where their true affection was. Not so much that they were cold, cold, <laughs> but they also weren't what? Hot towards the things of God. They were kind of in that middle, thinking they needed nothing when they did need something, didn't they? He says, set your affection on things above, not on things on earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. He even takes a step further. You're not just wretched and... Uh, destitute, you are what? You're dead. But in Christ we are made alive, aren't we? Amen. So set your affection on things of that. Verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall also appear, you shall also appear with him in glory. Therefore do what? Mortify, kill, therefore your members, not members of the church, members <laughs> of your body, which are upon the earth. 
those affections, the things that take us away from having desires and love toward God, right, are the things of the earth, like what? Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence. Oh, I do. Everybody had that? It hurts. <laughs> and covetousness, which is idolatry, your love. The world wants to take our love and give it to somebody else, doesn't it? Put our trust in something else. That will save me. What was going on in Laodicea? Their wealth. Their richness. Need of nothing. We, need, we don't need anything. Yes, you do. Because the things you have are of earth. Unless you have them of God, you need something, right? And he says, hey, get your, get your love right. What else? Verse 6. For which things sake the wrath of God come up on the children of disobedience, in the which you also walk some time when you lived in them. This is the way you used to live. And people will be punished for doing these things, right? Set your affection on the things of God. Verse 8. But now you are also put off all these things. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man in his deeds. Watch the way you use your what? Mouth. Because out of the mouth, what is speaking? The heart. Get your heart right. Don't speak of judgment and hatred and malice and complaining and why. I can go on and on. <laughs> what things should not be coming out of your mouth? Bad stuff. Bad stuff, right? Yeah. That shows your heart is growing what? Cold. It says fix that. Verse 10, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. And who created him? Well, we learned earlier in Colossians, who? Jesus. <laughs> in the image of Jesus. Verse 11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Don't be dividing up into different groups. There we are all one in Christ, aren't we? Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, patience, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. Change your... Don't do the love the way the world does the love. Do the self-sacrificing love, the other's first kind of love. Do that. Willing to forgive, willing to take the loss. Right? Not always about you. That's what a hot relationship is with God, isn't it? And not a cold one. Verse 14, and above all these things put on what? Charity. Anybody want to guess which kind of love that is? It's agape, yeah. Agape, self-sacrificing love, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be what? Thankful. And I have a feeling that was one of the problems the Laodiceans had in particular. Because frankly, when you feel like you are rich and need nothing, you are also not what? Thankful. Thankful. <laughs> yeah. The Bible, in fact, in the book of Romans tells us that's our main problem, wasn't it? We did not recognize God as God and also were not what? Thankful. And when you're not thankful and you think you don't need God, then you don't worship God like you're supposed to and you become cold. Or, in this case, even worse, lukewarm, right? And he's warning them, don't do that. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. That sounds like a hot relationship, doesn't it? One that's full of praise to God, thankfulness to God. Lift up your voices, right? Speak to each other with this hot love for one another and love for God, right? That's what he's calling them to. Do the people in Laodicea get it? Evidently not. Verse 17, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. And that's the problem with being lukewarm. Who's not part of your conversation? God's not. I'm just doing what I think is right. And because I have everything I need, I must be right. <laughs> is that a problem? Yeah, it is. That's why he says, I wish you were cold. 
Because then at least there'd be some consequences and you could see your error of your ways. I wish most of all you'd be hot though, right? With me, but instead you're putting your trust in the things of the world and you're really not doing it. In fact, look at uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Reminding them that what? Yes, and again, I bet a lot of these people in this church in Laodicea probably were owners. Seems like from history, they were like a lot of very rich people who owned a lot of companies and owned a lot of things and did a lot of that stuff. And this message is for them, which is what? You have a master. And who is the master of masters? Jesus is. So listen to him and treat your people right. Again, not looking to be rich and all those kinds of things and the things of this world. Be rich in the things of who? God, the eternal things. Verse 2, continuing in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. <laughs> talk to God, but talk to him with a heart of what? Thanksgiving. And that comes up over and over again. Thanksgiving's coming up. So we'll talk about it soon, I'm sure. But now Thanksgiving is such a major part of our relationship with God. Because when we forget to be thankful, do not give thanksgiving, then our heart does grow cold. So if we're not thankful to him, then who are we giving credit to? <laughs> <laughs> Ourselves, the things we have, the world, and that makes us lukewarm or even cold toward him. And he says, hey, buy of God, right? Buy the things that are important, the things that are eternal, and don't grow cold. Or else, Revelation. <laughs> Chapter 3. So in verse 18, he says, I counsel you. Uh, let's get this right. Get back to being hot. Buy the good stuff. Recognize that you are blind and naked and needed. Needy, right? And I will fulfill those things if you just come to me. Now, here's where we have a great diversion from every other letter. Every other letter he sends to the seven churches ends with, if anybody has ears, let him what? Hear. He does not end this one with this one. <laughs> Verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. So that's a little different, isn't it? The other ones, he's talking more about those who will overcome. Those who truly, those in the church, even if they're as bad as the one in Sardis or, or the one up in the, the Thessalonica. I mean, these are, there, there were some churches in here with big problems, weren't there? Serious, serious problems. Even there he said, hey, if you know me, you will overcome. And if you have an ear, let you hear. Come on, come, come back. <laughs> Restore the things that are weak. Let's, let's get going. But this one he's like... Um, Almost like, I'm going to rebuke and chase this church. What else can you do? If you've got a child who just basically says, I don't need you. <laughs> I don't need what you're selling. You can't tell me what to do. I've got everything I need. I can take or leave you. What do you have to remind them? You need me. <laughs> I brought you into this world, I can take you out of the world. You can't quote him anymore. Right? As many as I love, and there are those in the church that he does love, that he has a relationship with, who know them and are saved, right? But even they, I will what? I will rebuke and chase them. Because everybody's lukewarm. <laughs> Right? Even the saved ones are what? Lukewarm. So I'm going to have to come in there and I have to shake things up. I have to real, make you real. I don't take you up. You have to choose. Cold or hot. <laughs> right? In fact, chastening is a big part of God's job, isn't it? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. Don't need to raise hand, but everybody, anybody else ever had a whooping? 
Everybody been chastened by a parent or a teacher or a principal? No. <laughs> ah, the good old days. Anyway, <laughs> chastened, corrected, right? And sometimes when you are a stubborn, hard headed person, chastening requires a bit of uh, muscle, <laughs> right? It requires some drastic measures, doesn't it? And is God willing to go to drastic measures for his children? Absolutely. And there are people in the Laodicean church who are his children. But they're a problem. So he's going to have to do what? I'm going to have to rebuke and chasten them. Because I what? Love them. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and oh, scourges. It's tough. And scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deal with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? A spoiled child. And God will not have that, right? But if you be without chastisement, Wherefore, all are partakers, then you are bastards and not sons. So when God comes after this church, he is going to chase me. He's going to rebuke which ones? The ones that he loves. <laughs> the ones that are his children. They're going to have to endure that. To what end? So they can get better. So they can get hot. Right? Get back to the passions and things of importance to God. To go and get the things of God and focus on the things above and not the things of the earth. To put their trust in Him. God will have His way, won't He? In fact, let's go back to Revelation chapter 3. Because He also gives them what seems to be a little bit of an option. I rebuke and chasten who I love. So if you love me, when's a good time to change? <laughs> Be zealous, therefore. <laughs> and do what? Repent. Turn. If you love me, you know I love you. Now's a good time to get zealous. Now's a good time to get hot, right? Now's a good time to turn from the things of the world and time to buy of God and do those things eternal and get back to what you're supposed to be doing. Because I will ch chase on those I love. So repent. And what does repent mean? Turn. Turn to what you need to be doing. And the church in Laodicea needed to do that. The, the children of God in Laodicea needed to do that. And... Uh, this is something we need to listen to too, isn't it? In fact, all of these. Do we need to listen to the, what he says to all these churches? Because how's the church in America doing? We're not possibly given to that kind of thing, are we? We can't be a lukewarm church, can we? Given to resting in our riches and our need of nothing? <laughs> Putting trust in the things of the world? We wouldn't do that, would we? Not us good Christians, though, right? We can, and but will God chasten those he loves if they go down that path? Because what does God want us to be? Hot. Hot. <laughs> wants to be hot. We're going to have uh, soup in a couple of weeks. How many want lukewarm soup? <laughs> no. I don't even like the cold stuff. <laughs> that is an option I hear, but I'm not going to eat that. <laughs> Who wants hot soup? <laughs> Hot soup tastes good, right? That's what you need. And that's what God wants. He wants a hot church. <laughs> he wants boiling over and boiling up and ready to flavor the world, right? And that's what he wants, and that's what he deserves, isn't it? Because he's the what? The amen, the faithful and true witness, and the beginning of creation. He is the king of kings. He's the head of the church. He is everything. So if he says do it, we should what? Do it. And be hot for him and not give in to these things. And then, frankly, it is. Throughout the Bible, it talks about those who are rich in the things of the world. And he says how hard it is, isn't it? 
how hard it is for them to turn to God, to trust in God, to really give themselves over to them, because it is so easy just to trust in the riches of the world, isn't it? Get it all together. And it's easy to say, well, I've got all this stuff and I don't need anything, so God must be okay with what I'm doing. <laughs> but who should we talk to before we make such blatant statements? Talk to God. <laughs> Where am I with you? Thank you for all the blessing. Thank you for all the things you give me. I'll gladly give them up for you if you want me to. <laughs> They're yours. Use me. Use me. I want to be hot for you. I want to change the world for you. Whatever you want me to do. Okay? Put your trust in him. Right? Yes.